This is Pat's Two Cents, and we are reading from Isaiah 53. This is what I want to share with you guys, because we know we're coming up on Palm Sunday, and we know that life can throw some curves. Life can shock us at times, and we're not always sure how to deal with life or how to react to God for what we're going through. So what I want to share with you is the scripture the Lord laid on my heart, which is Isaiah 53. And I'm going to begin to read. And then, as you know, I will interject as I feel led to do so. Starting at verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form, nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Let me share this on that. What's really comical is every picture you see of Jesus, he looks like a perfect image of beauty, of a wonderful looking man. And the Bible makes it very plain. He wasn't what you would call catch material. Yeah, he wasn't what the women would go chasing after. So understand that he even allowed Jesus to come as a as a comely looking I mean maybe not comely not even that good to look at but just an ordinary joe so to speak because he wanted to he wanted to show that what he did through Jesus was of God verse 3 he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, here's the thing. We get a sour attitude, don't we? We get downright bitter from all the years of rejection that many of us have suffered from the hand of others, from the mouth or attitudes of others. We get bitter. We get hardened. And we just start to say, well, screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you. And we get all these little nasty attitudes dealing with the rejection that's got us so wounded, so angry, so resentful. I know that's true. I've been through it myself. So what I want to share with you is, I want you to think about how Jesus went through every single thing the same as us. Because, and the reason I say that, is because we don't realize how he, he associates, how he, how he identifies with us. Now listen, let me continue to read. Number four, so understand that in verse three, he was rejected. He, he was acquainted with sorrow, with grief right? And he was despised, disliked. Number four, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So we didn't think much of it because look at the poor, you know, the poor pitiful victim. You know, he got beat up. Boy, he can't even, you know, ball a fist and, and defend himself. Look at him. That's the way a lot of people see him. Number five, but he was wounded for our transgressions, yours and mine. Those of you who don't think much of him, who don't think about him at all, who have no regard for him. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for your transgressions. Check that out. He was bruised for our iniquities, your iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, though, check this out. We are healed. So we benefit from all that he's gone through for our sake. Number six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 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 Let me add. All. Number seven. Check this out. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. How many of you could be mistreated and keep your mouth shut while you're going through it? 
Oh, you're going to get somebody told, baby. Oh, you're not going to play me like that. You're not going to disrespect me. Oh, you're going to diss me? Well, let me put you in your place. No, that's not Jesus. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. He had done no violence. Yet he paid the price. Ain't that something? Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, why would it please the Lord to bruise him? Because he loves you and me. That's why. Because he loves his creation. God is love. And you don't understand his love until you really understand what he put his own son through. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see a seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So whatever Jesus did worked out the way God wanted to. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute because I want you to understand that Jesus, that's what makes him our high priest. He knows. See, Peter mentioned it early and you're going to hear his message. Jesus is God. When the Bible in John chapter 1 verse 1 refers to the word, the word is capitalized. The word was with God. In the beginning, it says, in the beginning, the word was with God. Who does the word represent? Jesus. Jesus was the word. Listen, Jesus is the word. So when John says, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And here's the key right here. The word was God. You can look at all these prophets, all these people from, from days of old, but Jesus is the only one. This is what sets him apart. He died for us. But after he died for us, he took authority over death, hell, and the grave. And guess what? He rose from the dead. But the bottom line is Jesus is the only one who rose from the dead and never died again. Anybody else who may have been risen from the dead, guess what? They had to die once again. Jesus rose from the dead never died again. So what I want you to consider is when you look at who Jesus is, he is the head honcho. He is God, the Son. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But in our life, this is what benefits us. In our life, Jesus knows what we're going through. He knows. He's acquainted with frustration. He's acquainted with anger. He's acquainted with hurt. He's acquainted with rejection. He knows what it's like to be disappointed. He knows what it's like to be disillusioned. He knows. He knows. He knows what it feels like to feel pain. Mentally, emotionally, and physically. He knows pain very well. So when you start to point your bony finger up at God and blame him for not caring about you, there's no way God cannot care for you because God is love. See, love doesn't contradict itself. God doesn't contradict himself. Jesus doesn't contradict himself. They are true blue, baby. What you see is what you get. But you got to give him a try. Because all of those things you're dealing with, all those attitudes, all those emotional quandaries that you're in, all those knots that are tied up in your gut that you got accumulated from childhood wounds, from abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, bullying, rape, 
molestation. From your family treating you like you're the last one hired and the first one fired. You're the one with all the dashed hopes. You're the one that everybody else, you're the second thought. You're the last resort. And you know it. But you're the butt end of every joke. And when it comes to jokes, you're at the top of the totem pole. Well, guess what? You're not a joke. Jesus didn't die for jokes. He died for his creation. He died for you. So whatever you do, before you get too bitter, before you get too hard and hearted, before you reject him altogether, give him a shot. Give him a try. See what he'll do in your life. Because I can tell you firsthand. See, I may not be able to talk about somebody else, but I can talk about me. I don't have to go by what the Bible said alone because I experienced his love. I know he loves me. I don't have to go by what somebody else said because God manifested himself to me when he delivered me from the root of rejection that plagued me from childhood. When the Lord took me from dream to dream to dream, the Lord, not anybody else, not a psychiatrist, not medication, from dream to dream to dream, getting me over and healed from the rejection I got from my mother, the feeling of not being wanted, the feeling of, of, of my mother wishing I had never been born. It's a horrible feeling when you think your mother feels that way towards you. But God healed me from it all. I'm telling you this because you need to understand who Jesus is. He's not just a sacrificial lamb. He's also our healer. He's our psychologist. He's our deliverer. He's our friend. He sticks closer than a brother. So before you go turning around all your little beggarly elements, you're trying to hook up with them and hook up with that group and hook up with this gang because you want to be accepted. You want folks to like you. you. You're scratching and digging for love in all the wrong places. Baby, God is love. Why would you not give him a chance when you know that's the main, that's your core need. Your core need is love. Love, acceptance, feeling substantial and important, being able to love and appreciate yourself, getting to understand what makes you tick. That's Jesus. When the song says Jesus is the answer for the world today, above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. Give him a shot, will you please? You will notice a very big difference in your life. Even your countenance will change. One of these days, I'm going to dig up some of my old pictures and you can see the countenance of insecurity, of self-hatred, of neediness. Mm. Hard up, desperate and needy. That was me. An emotional cripple. That was me. But it ain't no more. Why? Jesus was my answer. Jesus is my answer, and Jesus will forever be my answer. I don't want any other. What do you want? God bless you. Amen.